A Double-Barreled Detective Story by Mark Twain, Part 1, Chapter 4, and I'll continue from where I stopped the last time. Two days before the before-mentioned October morning, Flint had bought some things, and he and Fatlock had brought them home to Flint's cabin. A fresh box of candles, which they put in the corner, a tin can of blasting powder, which they placed upon the candle box, a keg of blasting powder, which they placed under Flint's bunk, a huge coil of fuse, which they hung on a peg. Fetlock reasoned that Flint's mining operations had outgrown the pick and that blasting was about to begin now. He had seen blasting done, and he had had a notion of the process, but he had never helped in it. His conjecture was right. Blasting time had come. In the morning, the pair carried fuse, drills, and the powder can to the shaft. It was now eight feet deep, and to get into it and out of it, a short ladder was used. They descended, and by command, Fetlock held the drill without any instructions as to the right way to hold it, and Flint proceeded to strike. The sledge came down, the drill sprang out of Fetlock's hand almost as a matter of course. You mangy son of a... Is that any way to hold a drill? Pick it up, stand it up, there, hold fast. Do you... I'll teach you. At the end of an hour, the drilling was finished. Now then, charge it. The boy started to pour in the powder. Idiot! A heavy bat on the jaw laid the lad out. Get up. You can't lie sniveling there. Now then, stick in the fuse first. Now put in the powder. Hold on, hold on. Are you going to fill the hole all up? Of all the sap-headed milksops, I put in some dirt, put in some gravel, tamp it down, hold on, hold on, oh great Scott, get out of the way. He snatched the iron and tamped the charge himself, meantime cursing and blaspheming like a fiend. Then he fired the fuse, climbed out of the shaft and ran fifty yards away, Fatlock following. They stood waiting a few minutes, then a great volume of smoke and rocks burst high into the air with a thunderous explosion. After a little, there was a shower of descending stones. Then all was serene again. I wish to God you'd been in it, remarked the master. They went down the shaft, cleaned it out, drilled another hole, and put in another charge. Look here, how much fuse are you proposing to waste? Don't you know how to time a fuse? No, sir, you don't. Well, if you don't beat anything I ever saw. He climbed out of the shaft and spoke down. Well, idiot, are you going to be all day? Cut the fuse and light it. The trembling creature began... If you please, sir, I... You talk back to me! Cut it and light it! The boy cut and lit. Great Scott, a one-minute fuse I wish you were in! In his rage, he snatched the ladder out of the shaft and ran. The boy was aghast. Oh, my God! Help! Help! Oh, save me! He implored. Oh, what can I do? What can I do? He backed against the wall as tightly as he could. The sputtering fuse frightened the voice out of him. His breath stood still. He stood gazing and impotent. In two seconds, three seconds, four, he would be flying toward the sky, torn to fragments. Then he had an inspiration. He sprang at the fuse, severed the inch of it that was left above ground, and was saved. He sank down, limp and half lifeless with fright, his strength all gone. But he muttered with a deep joy, He has lent me. I knew there was a way, if I would wait. 
After a matter of five minutes, Buckner stole to the shaft, looking worried and uneasy, and peered down into it. He took in the situation. He saw what had happened. He lowered the ladder, and the boy dragged himself weakly up it. He was very white. His appearance added something to Buckner's uncomfortable state, and he sat with a show of regret and sympathy which sat upon him awkwardly from the lack of practice. It was an accident, you know. Don't say anything about it to anybody. I was excited and didn't notice what I was doing. You're not looking well. You've worked enough for today. Go down to my cabin and eat what you want and rest. It's just an accident, you know, on account of my being excited. It scared me, said the lad, as he started away. But I learned something, so I don't mind it. Damned easy to please, muttered Buckner, following him with his eye. I wonder if he'll tell, mightn't he? I wish... I had killed him. The boy took no advantage of his holiday in the matter of resting. He employed it in work, eager and feverish and happy work. A thick growth of chaparral extended down the mountainside clear to Flint's cabin. The most of Fatlock's labor was done in the dark intricacies of that stubborn growth. The rest of it was done in his own shanty. At last, all was complete, and he said, If he's got any suspicions that I'm going to tell on him, he won't keep them long. Tomorrow, he will see that I am the same milksop as I always was, all day and the next. And the day after tomorrow, night, there'll be an end of him, Nobody will ever guess who finished him up, nor how it was done. He dropped me the idea, his own self, and that's odd. So that one's for today. Bye-bye. Till next time with chapter 5, titled The Next Day Came and Went. <laughs>